just like he said, you guys wouldn't be anything without the mothers. We wouldn't be anything without the fathers. And so it's a mutual thing. And as much as you love us, we love you and we appreciate you and we need you. So um, keep up the good work, keep what you're doing and pass it on to the next generation because fathers are important and black fathers are extremely important. And so we love you. Um, our kids love you. We need you. We appreciate you. And so, you know, thank you guys for being out here and showing how much you guys care. And happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Freedom leads us in their life and leads us to our future The choice is ours and their destiny. So we got to look at our history to determine where their destiny is going to be. So that's what this is about, all right? So if you got any questions, take some pictures. But if you can't hear me, kind of listen to some of the things you're going to say about some of the places we're going to stop at. And we're going to make this pilgrimage down to Butler Street YMCA. The reason we're going down there because this is the the uh, pilgrimage walk that Dr. King did. Walking to learn how to swim, learn to play basketball, which we you know he was great at. But all these things he did through his vision to make the great city of Atlanta. Also, Manor Jackson, who was intentional about economic development for African Americans in the city of Atlanta, which made Atlanta the city it is today. But we're allowing other people to come in and take back, take what we built. We got to be intentional about what we have, what we build, and how we grow. Am I making sense? Y'all yes, with me? Yes, All right, let's do this thing. this corridor, that means that they're playing. There's something that's in the works. Oh, well, now we gotta make a decision. Are we gonna hold and stand the forefront and keep the land that we got, or are we gonna let it go? It's amazing, and we got communities that were drug infested, that were so bad that if you drove through there, you, was gonna get, you were gonna get carjacked. But our white cohorts turned around and ended up moving in those communities, made the changes, changed the law, cleaned it up, and then made the property the, uh, enhanced the property by 300%. And we wonder why we couldn't do that and stayed in our own communities. Now we're trying to get this. Right here, this is Cox Brothers Home. I want you to see this right here. Look at this. Because of the of Jim Crow laws and the Civil War, black communities in the South had to provide their own essential services including funerals and burials, Emily Cox and her son, Charles, found the Cox Brothers Funeral Home. We had to do things because they weren't doing it for us. My question is, what are we going to start doing for our own selves instead of keep going to somebody else to do for what we need to do in our own community? You know? Exactly. We got to teach. Oh, you got to tell them about Big Ben. You know about Big Ben? I know about Big Ben. I thought he was here. He was. I think he came back down to the store. Big okay. Ben is a... That's an example of an FOI being recruited. I'm telling you, bro. Yeah, we said that way first. Yeah. This, this brother. Is, is he oh, I mean, well, let me see if Big Ben is. If not, just tell who Big Ben is. All right. Yeah, that. Ben, All right. Ben, so, yeah, we're going to let Big Ben tell you his story. Yeah, we're talking say, about Wheat Street. When someone trying to write you off, don't believe them. Just because you might be dealing with some things that you're addicted to, don't mean you can't overcome it. And just because you're down, don't mean you can't rise. This brother's story right here, he literally is, 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 is what you would call the rags to riches. But the thing is, he stayed true, he stayed in his hood, and when people tried to tell him to leave and think he was crazy, he didn't stand for it. He is the man. Yeah, how we doing? All right, yeah. tell me a little bit about right, yourself, right. about who the great. Right, I'm Benjamin Big Mouth Ben Graham. I tell y'all how I got the name Big Mouth Ben Graham, but what's incredible is that um, my life was transformed. If you look down the street here, two blocks from here is the bridge I slept under, strung out. Yep. I suffered a 17-year drug addiction and mental illness. Now, I graduated on a roll student, and I went to the University of Georgia and still ended up under a bridge. Choices. But I had some unresolved childhood traumas that played a role when I went to college and I started making bad choices. I got into the drug trade, and I got busted three months later, and I took my first hit of crack a year later, and that resulted into that 17 year drug addiction. Yep. But upon a spiritual awakening, I was able to reach out to God, pray, and turn it all around. 
and I went from sleeping under that bridge to owning this store with my college sweetheart. She just pulled up. She wow. saw me. Wow. This is why, so we were college sweethearts, and we found yeah. each other 24 years later. Wow. And one more quick testimony, too. Even during my struggle with addiction, I couldn't keep a regular job. I worked on the back of a garbage truck doing labor pool. And I was riding on the back, and one day they was back and back while I was on the back, and they backed me into a dump truck and crushed my pelvis. Wow. The only thing connecting the top and bottom was the spinal cord. These bones here were crushed. So I have a bar here that connects my legs. A year later, with determination in God, I healed and I took that same wheelchair and I put a cool in it, I put snacks on it, yep. and I started walking around selling snacks. And that's how I got the name Big Mouth Ben. While I was walking around, people could advertise, so I said, Big Mouth Ben, if you want to sell it, let me tell it. And people will come and put their flyers on the wheelchair. I later designed that bike that you see behind you but it wasn't, it wasn't yellow then, it was just a regular bike with a cooler on the back. So, like I say, that spiritual awakening from the bottom of that bridge, realizing that I am somebody. For 17 years, I fought and struggled against addiction. I was so defeated, I felt like nothing. I even attempted to kill myself. So, upon that spiritual awakening and, and realizing that there is a better life, all I had to do was make better choices. I began to pursue that better life, which is one of my themes, dreams ahead, proceed with determination. And here I am today. So thank y'all for letting me share. Is that what was good man right there? All right, those borders. Now, what is his legacy? It's huge. Now, when Dr. King said he wanted to hear some real preaching, go read his autobiography. He said he can't. He snuck up from his de that church to this church to hear Dr. Borders. Dr. Borders is the one who created "I Am Somebody." You might have heard it through Jesse Jackson. It was Dr. Borders. <laughs> Dr. Borders built this seniors' home. Dr. Borders built this housing called We Street over here that is torn down now. The first public housing built by a church in the country was We Street. Mm. The first seniors home built by a church back in the 50s in this country was We Street, what you see right here. He owns that lot, all this property, he owned all this property up and down. Dr. Borders preached economic development. Dr. Borders also, his, his, his granddaughter, you might know her, she was city council president, Lisa Borders. Now she's head of the WNBA. That's his granddaughter. But Dr. Borders has a huge legacy. He was the first voting rights thing for black people in this city. He helped start Wheat Street. There was also a soda pop company up the street on Auburn Avenue. Coca-Cola's first building was on Edgewood. Two blocks away was a black company. We see Coca-Cola today is a multi-billion dollar company. Brown Soda Pop Company went out of business but they competed with each other back then. And then discrimination and segregation knocked that out. So Dr. Borders did this. I'm, I'm, it's a, it's, it's a, this is kind of a deviated story. 1984, when uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan was looking for a place to speak in this city, the churches wouldn't let him in. Dr. Borders said, all right, son, I went and I spoke with him. He used to live right here in this house. Minister Farrakhan spoke at this church. And then it came, his whole power program came out of speech that he gave in his church. But Dr. Borders, he came in, he listened in the church, and he said, that's the best preaching out in her. He said, that's the best young preacher in America. That's what he said about it. This is 34 years ago. the richest black street in America. Sweet. 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 It was, no, it's called Sweet. Auburn Avenue. It was put, the, the nickname and the, the title Sweet Auburn was put on it because we was making so much money here. But if you look on the thing, it's just Auburn Avenue. Yeah. It's, we it's, start, the people start calling it sweet all. All the people that businesses down here, they said because the money was sweet. They said that sugar was sweet. <laughs> and they all, and John Dobbs, you see his head here, and he did a lot of great things for Atlanta. So if you want to take a picture in front of it quickly, we can do that. So and it, one more thing. The reason why the face is here, because people just say, why the face just for his face? It's not for the face. The reason why the eyes are here is because he had a vision. And the Bible says, where there's no vision, the people shall what? Perish. Where there's no vision, the people shall what? Perish. So, if a man, as Reverend Ward was saying, has a mission, it makes it easier for those to follow him. So he had a mission to make this an area that was lucrative for us as a people. So when you look through these eyes, it's not, oh, I'm just looking at Auburn Avenue. 
you're doing a symbolization of you looking at the vision that this man had for us as a people to make this album sweet. Yeah. I'm going to say one more thing. How many of you all heard of Sweet Auburn Festival? I've seen it. The big, biggest festival in Atlanta. All right, the quick story. 1986, 1986, the mosque was right here in this building. It's where the miss was, but Nation of Islam was in this building. We were in this building right here, and so Benny Smith was on the bar right there in that building where you see all the stuff in the window. Benny came along the block. It was it, during the day you see prostitutes and drugs everywhere, up and down the street. So Benny said, we got to revive the neighborhood. So he went and got Jose Williams, Daddy King, Dr. Borders, William McKinley from uh, Big Bethel, and he got us, the nation visit, got all the religious leaders. Jose Williams held the meeting. We held it down in the casino right across from the Peacock. They said, we want to revive this neighborhood, and we're going to do a walk. And we're going to do a walk, and we're going to end it right here under the bridge, and we're going to perform. So we did a walk. James Brown performed right here under the bridge. It's 1986. We had 5,000 people. We thought it was going to be the hope. same walk we're doing now. We hoped for 100. That's how the Sweet Auburn Festival started. It was just a walk. And we got, we were hoping for 1,000. We got 5,000. Jose Williams led it. And from there, it morphed into the Sweet Auburn Festival. Then it was moved to the block over when the trolley came through. Mayor Reed moved it over. That's how it happened. All the religious leaders on this block came together. And I represented, Maha I represented the Nation of Islam. And it was Borders, Dr. King, Daddy King, and all of us. We met right up the street, and we formed that thing that became Sweet Art. That's how it, that's how it started. That's the true history of it. We continue on with this walk with What's Dad.